Hi, I am Dr. Corey Wong, and for this module, we are going to be talking about Peggy McIntosh's piece on white privilege and male privilege. This is a really quintessential essay that talks about uh, understanding and unpacking privilege as something that we typically don't know or are aware of because that's the nature of privilege. We're taught to not see it and recognize it. But Peggy McIntosh is doing something interesting here where she says, uh, engaging in feminist work, I realize the way that men are typically so oblivious to their own privilege, and that's so annoying or problematic, but also she's explaining her own process of coming to conscious awareness of the fact that she also has white privilege, and then is kind of understanding that, wow, I have my own privilege and I wasn't even aware of it, here's how that shows up. So here's a list of the things that I've seen my privilege in when it's so hard to identify, because that's the nature of privilege, She's trying to spell it out and say, like, even as a woman oppressed by sexist systems of oppression, I have privilege that I have not been uh, aware of as a white person and because of her class background. So it's a way to help illustrate that we all have probably some elements of privilege and disadvantage. And it's we there's important work to be done in terms of coming to awareness of our own matters of privilege. But... I'm going to introduce Peggy McIntosh's essay and then try to push it a little bit further into ways to understand privilege too. So at the very beginning, um, Peggy McIntosh explains that she had realized that she had been taught to acknowledge oppression and the disadvantage of others, but had not been simultaneously taught to see the corollary aspect of that, which is um, privilege and how that puts some people at an advantage. And this is typically a way that people talk about privilege. There are these benefits and unearned assets that help one move through the world more easily or uh, have greater access to resources and networks and opportunities. But as she describes it, she says, um, I've come to see white privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets that I can count on cashing in each day, but about which I was meant to remain oblivious. This is the sort of thing where it's like the obliviousness of privilege is to make people think that, well, I worked hard to get where I am. I've earned everything on my own. And that's not to say people don't work hard, but it's instead to acknowledge that there are some things that have been granted to you throughout your life that have facilitated your movement that other people don't have. So she goes on to say that white privilege is like an invisible weightless knapsack of special provisions, assurances, tools, maps, guides, code books, Passports, visas, clothes, compass, emergency gear, and blank checks. And that's all very much like we're going on a hiking expedition. But realistically, the way that privilege works is that you have tools, resources, uh, connections, and access to people, support systems, programs, funds that will literally help you move through the world. So uh, I like to think of it as like you have, yeah, blank checks that you can write if you need to because you've got funds in the bank to support your fees that might help you move through the world. And it could also be something as realistic and concrete as like, I have a working car that will enable me to be able to get from point A to point B, even if that's like, I need to go to a job interview. Whereas there's privilege in my ease of access with that, where if I'm dependent on a public transit, transit system schedule, and then, or needing funds to be able to ride that system, there's a difference in how easily I can move through the world. Not to say nobody's working hard here, but it's a different experience. In that, what Peggy McIntosh is saying too is that the privilege is something that we are meant to not be aware of. And she goes on to say that I review in this essay several types of layers of denial that I see at work protecting and preventing awareness about entrenched forms of privilege. So that's an interesting thing because we can't just think of privilege as this like, well, some people have it and some people don't. So everybody should get privilege because it's easy to move through the world. It's a benefit that we should all have access to. Somewhere deeper down, there's this insidious level of privilege, which is if we're not supposed to know about it, it's probably because it's actually working to help maintain inequities and systems of domination and oppression. That way we can say, you don't have this high status in society because you've been lazy or you've made bad choices or you just aren't trying hard enough, which is a way to keep unquestioning the systems that might be keeping some communities and people down versus elevating others and helping them succeed and do well. There are many ways uh, to understand what privilege looks like. Peggy McIntosh gives a whole list of examples of when she realized her white privilege was coming through. 
um, that can be in terms of like seeing yourself in television or magazines or in representations through culture or history books. And then something as simple as like, I can go to the drugstore and buy band-aids that match my skin tone. So her list is pretty interesting. And it, I think what it does is highlight all these sort of unrecognized things that if you don't, if you're not attuned to your own privilege, then you are not going to see these things. It's stuff we take for granted. But even at that level, it might be a little bit difficult to find the connection to. So how is that participating in oppressive structures? Um, we'll get there, <laughs> but let's keep going deeper in terms of understanding how else privilege can show up that makes it a little bit more meaningful and substantive. Um, on one hand, Peggy McIntosh says that privilege, these examples of privilege she's highlighting are so easy to forget and take for granted that she realizes um, she has to work hard to give up certain certain patterns of belief or behavior that she has been taking for granted. One of them is that she has to give up the myth of meritocracy. She says that if these things are true, this is not such a free country. One's life is not what one makes it. it many doors are open for certain people through no virtues of their own. In addition to concrete resources that can help one navigate the world more easily, like funds, connections, opportunities, etc., healthcare, food, all this stuff, there's another component of privilege that is much more uh, psychological, emotional, and gets to the notion of like, can you literally live well or not? So Macintosh explains that some other categories and examples of privilege include those that make her feel at home in the world. Others allow me to escape penalties or dangers that others suffer. Through some privileges, I escape fear, anxiety, insult, injury, or a sense of not being welcome or not being real. Some privileges keep me from having to hide, to be in disguise, to feel sick or crazy, or to negotiate each transaction from the position of being an outsider or within my group, a person who is suspected of having too close of links with the dominant culture. Most of my privileges keep me from having to be angry. In that passage, she's highlighting so many different experiences of people who know what it's like to be marginalized, who know what it's like to be dominated by others or by systems. So feeling at home, not having to feel anxious for threat of violence, a sense of safety and belonging. If you can walk into a room and see people like you, who get you, who know you, that's a privilege. If you are concerned about how you're gonna walk through the streets and if people are going to look at you weird, accuse you of being a threat or of being a criminal, then that's not privilege. If you feel like you can have a genuine experience and know who you are, being comfortable with your normalcy, <laughs> that's privilege. But if you feel like my sexual identity or my gender identity, maybe there's something wrong with me, I must be sick, or perverted or something else, that's usually a mark of not privilege. And all of these standards of assessing who's okay and who's not okay are again, not inherent to the individuals, but largely informed by systems of hierarchy of valuing certain people and groups over others. So then that incurs a kind of psychological toll, anxiety, fear, and risk that she's capturing in this passage of you, some privileges keep you from having to be angry because I'm not, being threatened by certain things. I don't have to be on the defense. I'm fine just moving through the world. So we can have the privilege of just positive thinking and gratitude for how blessed we are versus being, no, I'm angry that I am consistently being slighted and undermined in unjust and unfair ways. That's not privilege. A another way to spin a little bit how privilege can be understood is to not just think about it as these benefits and privileges or or advantages that some people have in this, everyone should have. Because when we make the connection of privilege to oppression, we can see that privilege is not always something that we want. Another way to phrase it that Macintosh does, does is by referring to it as a conferred sense of dominance. She says such privilege simply confers dominance, gives permission to control because of one's race or sex. And the kind of privilege that gives a license to some people to be at best thoughtless and at worst murderous, should not continue to be referred to as a desirable attribute. So if someone has the privilege to walk in public with a gun and threaten other people, or has the privilege to walk into a workspace and sexually harass others and not be threatened or challenged in that, that's not the kind of privilege we want everybody to have, to be 
dominators or oppressors. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. We can't just think about privilege as something that we need to give up so that other people can have ease of access. We need to be questioning the very things that one's race, class, or gendered privilege allows you to do that is harmful and oppressive without consequence or retribution or accountability. In that same vein, another way we connect privilege to systems of oppression is by recognizing that if one has privilege, one then also has the power to choose whether to participate or not in dismantling those systems of oppression. If you are living with oppression and you feel every day the weight of injustice, then you are probably going to be angry versus having the privilege to not be affected or angry by it. And Macintosh says there's also this element of you know you have privilege if you can choose to care or not care, to participate or not participate. If, well, it's convenient this weekend, so I guess I'll go protest, or it's convenient this weekend, so I guess I'll go and address a concern of a friend who's troubled or having a really hard time. Um, this power to choose is itself a mark of privilege, but that means it's the power to choose to either dismantle oppression or be complicit in it, largely, by not questioning it or trying to take it down. So Macintosh says that in writing this paper, I've also realized that white identity and status, in particular class identity and status too, give me considerable power to choose whether to broach this subject and its trouble. I can pretty well decide whether to disappear and avoid and not listen and escape the dislike I may engender in other people through this essay, or interrupt, answer, interpret, preach, correct, criticize, and control to some extent what goes on in reaction to it. All of this is a mark of privilege to be able to manage if and how one will engage in contentious topics around oppression and social justice. Being white, I'm given considerable power to escape many kinds of danger or penalty, as well as to choose which risks I want to take. That means it's a privilege to say I'm going to put myself out on the front lines and stand for something versus the not privilege, the disadvantage of always already being at risk of attack or violence or harm. When we talk about privilege, a lot of people say, well, we recognize this now, that if privilege means we have the opportunity to choose if and how we want to engage, it also grants us access to power and resources that maybe others should have, but we just arbitrarily have based on how and where we were born. Um, so people say, well, we should use to learn to leverage our privilege to dismantle those systems of oppression. And that, yes, is something to do. If you are in a position of power and influence and you have access to resources, then you can leverage your privilege to dismantle systems of oppression. That's why we need allies and advocates and compatriots in the fight. But we are still not often aware of the fact that privilege can make you under-equipped to dismantle those systems of oppression. And that goes back to the very beginning of what Macintosh was saying of, the nature of privilege is that we're taught to not recognize it because it's usually in the service of perpetuating systems of oppression. So I'm going to add on to what Macintosh offers here of another way to think about privilege, which is privilege as a deficit, not as just a knapsack of assets that are helpful that you can pull your tools out to get through. I am thinking privilege can actually be a lack of resources, a deficit of knowledge, in particular a deficit of understanding what the problems really are, which means you may not be yet equipped to use your privilege to dismantle systems of oppression. Largely, you don't know what you're fighting against because you haven't had the awareness of what that even looks like because of your privilege. So in this way, this links back to the previous module we did on how epistemology is political. I just connected privilege to knowledge, meaning privilege is a deficit of knowledge, of critical understandings of how systems of oppression can work. So if that's the case, then people who have credibility based on their identity of that neutral observer or the objective knower, they may be less equipped to be the ones to take on important social issues. So we should probably shift and go to the people who don't have privilege, who live the realities every day, because they might know much more about what the issues are, what the needs are, and how to dismantle it. Privilege can provide a comfort zone of ignorance, and that's another way to connect it back to the last module. Privilege is usually marked by a whole production of ignorance about reality, about oppression. So it's not just an ignorance about privileges, 
that I, oh, I never thought about my Band-Aid color. Instead, it's an ignorance about privilege in systems of oppression. We are probably less equipped to not only understand the problems, but also to engage with real people. So here's another way, if we take it like to practice, if you're coming from a place of privilege, you probably also lack the skills for engaging, not just the knowledge and the insight, but the skills. So like for instance, um, if I have the privilege of speaking English as my first language, and others say, or get yelled at on the street, say, speak English, talk American, that's a pretty messed up thing to say when we don't acknowledge that maybe having multiple languages, multiple cultural experiences, and the familiarity to be able to go in and out of different communities and understand communities from different perspectives is actually an asset. So me not having that more diverse perspective and experience of multiple communities, multiple cultural backgrounds or perspectives, that's me at a deficit. Whereas others, namely those who are typically marginalized as being not credible knowers, probably have resources to even be able to navigate those conversations with others too, beyond their own direct experience. They are more equipped to code switch, to connect with communities in ways that are not imperialistic and to communicate across these differences in a ways that could be very much more effective. If I come from a limited place of cushy privilege and thus ignorance, then I'm probably the least equipped person to be going ahead and forging a path to dismantle systems of oppression versus the people who live it and know it already.